Hello and welcome to this, the second of our video lectures on uh, CIE A-level physics. Today we're going to be looking at uh, going from uh, what you have done so far, which is looking at springs uh, and uh, general objects, to generalising that, making it about materials. Um, so up till now, you have lots of formulas, well one formula really, you have Hooke's Law, which explains how a single material like a spring will behave. And you've used that to find the force constant, and from the force constant you've been able to work out what any extension will be. Well today we're going to try and generalise that a little bit more, and we're going to start to look at how any particular material will behave. And our goal is to get to the point where I can give you the properties of a certain material, like steel or aluminium or tungsten, and the shape of an object, and you're going to be able to tell me how it will behave. Um, so we need to be able to calculate stress, strain, and Young's modulus, which are all things we'll talk about later today. You need to be able to clearly explain the differences between force and stress, and extension and strain. And you're going to appreciate how we can use this idea of dimensional analysis in equations and looking at phenomena. So, so far you have a graph, you've all produced graphs that look something like this. Um, with the slight exception that rather than these saying strain and stress, uh, you have extension and you have force. Now, my apologies, uh, my normal pen has run out of batteries, so it's going to be writing like I'm a four year old. Um, so I suggest you re listen to what I'm saying as well, because I will uh, repeat these things as well. Um, now, what you might notice on these graphs is that you have a couple of interesting points. Um, one point is up here, um, and what you find here is that it stops obeying Hooke's law. Hooke's law tells us that we should, well, Hooke's law uh, is that force is equal to the force constant multiplied by extension. So that gives us a straight line, and you can see at the cross that I've marked on there, it's no longer a straight line. So we can call that the limit of proportionality. And pretty much all materials um, do obey Hooke's law to a small extent. Rubber's a bit weird, rubber tends to give us a curve, but nearly everything else will obey Hooke's law up to a point. Some things like glass, it only obeys it for fractions of a millimetre, um, but it's there if you can measure it accurately enough. However, also nearly all materials have a limit of proportionality where they stop obeying Hooke's law and they start to curve. Um, what you also might notice is that you'll often see graphs with this kind of profile that curves downwards. Now you're never going to get that in your lessons, um, and the reason for that is that we have this section here called necking. And what that means is, if you consider your material, uh, it has a cross section like that. Now, necking occurs at this point here, and at that point, what we start to see is that the material dips inwards in the centre, and that's because you're drawing it out into wires. So what happens then is that, because this has got thinner, um, it immediately starts to pull apart, and that's where it breaks. So your graphs can only go up to the cross here, uh, because it will break beyond that point. Um, one of the things that I got you to do in most of your lessons uh, was think about unloading. So you all produced graphs along here, and then what a lot of you found is that then when you unloaded them, they came down a different path. And what you found was that they had been stretched. Permanently stretched. Now, the reason for that is what you can think about how the, it helps to think about the uh, arrangement of the molecules and the uh, structure of the actual materials. So, uh, I'm going to call this point one. At point one, you can imagine the molecules as kind of a big network of chains. Most things tend to act a bit like a polymer, so they're kind of chains all around each other. But when we reach point two over here, what we've done is we started to make the chains all line up by pulling them outwards. And then if we get to point three, 
Then what we're starting to do is actually separate the chains. So we're doing an actual chemical change now. We're moving how they're bonded to each other. So at this point, we've got a permanent stretch. 0.3 gives us permanent stretch. So it no longer returns back to the zero point. Um, so there's a couple of points that we call it here. So L is where it stops obeying Hooke's law. So we call that the elastic, sorry, the uh, limit of proportionality, not the elastic limit. Uh, we call that the limit of proportionality. no idea how hard it is to write on the screen with this pen. It sucks. Uh, e is the point where it will no longer return to its original length. So we call that the elastic limit. So elastic basically means it'll go back to the same point. Like a piece of elastic, it'll go back to the same length. Once you go back past the elastic limit, if you tried to go down, so you unloaded it, you'd see that your graph would kind of do this and meet at the axis over here. Uh, the other points for now we don't really need to worry, apart from B, which would be our breaking point. In other words, it's the point where we've put so much force on it uh, that the atoms inside won't point, uh, where the atoms can no longer hold together uh, and it separates out. So, even working with different wires and different threads, and one thing that I hope has started to occur to you is that the equations we've got so far aren't terribly helpful, because sometimes you could have thick wires and sometimes you could have thin wires. Um, and the only way that we've got at the moment, using Hooke's law, to tell how much they'll stretch by, is to just experiment with another piece of wire and see how much it stretches. And that's not terribly useful for us. So what we need is a more generalised form. So I'm going to talk to you now about the generalised form. So there are two things that we need. The first is stress, um, and that is sometimes represented by the symbol sigma, sometimes by the word stress, sometimes by an S. Uh, C, I, E don't tend to use the term sigma, but I'm, uh, I'm dyed in the wall with that, so I'm going to use um, that symbol. So it's the force per unit area applied to a material. So hopefully you can consider what that must be. The equation for that, therefore, will be sigma for stress is equal to force divided by area. Now that suddenly starts to make uh, things a bit simpler and a bit fairer. Because if you think about it, if I have a wire with a huge cross-sectional area compared to a wire with a small cross-sectional area, I would expect to need a massive force to stretch this one as much as this one. So I'd expect the small one to only need a little force, while the big one would need a big force. So by dividing by the unit area, I'm making things fair and I'm making uh, something that I can compare more easily. Because stress, it takes away that, that element of having a thick wire or a thin wire. Now one of the things that you need to know is the units for that. So hopefully you can remember from IGCSE that force uh, has the unit of newtons and area has the unit of meters squared. So sigma has the units, or stress has the units, of newtons per meter squared. Now, if you remember from the GCSE, newtons per meter squared is called a pascal. It's the same as the unit of pressure. Um, and you can think of it as pressure, because pressure is just force divided by area. It's not pressure in the classical sense, because we don't have something bashing into it. We're actually doing a pull instead. Um, but it's exactly the same thing. It's a force over an area. So that's why we call it pascals. The other thing we need to think about is that if I'm putting stress on a shape that looks like this, I'm going to have a very different amount of total extension compared to a shape that just looks like this. This one I would expect to stretch a lot more than this one. Because if you think about it, each section along the large one 
has the same force all along it. So, it's, so each of those sections is going to move apart. Whereas this one, it only has a smaller uh, length. So I would expect smaller extension. So to get around that, what I need to think about now is strain as extension per unit length. So I can write that as delta L divided by L. Delta uh, is a, so that delta is a triangle symbol there. It's a Greek letter, it's a Greek capital letter, and it means chain. So I have change in length over original length. And if we think about our dimensional analysis again, this new tool that we're learning about, well, length is measured in meters, or sorry, change in length is measured in meters, and length is also measured in meters. So what we find is it cancels. So there are no units for strain, which is actually quite handy for us as physicists because it means that we could do strain in uh, yards per yards, or inches per inches, and it's actually the same. This is one of those very, very few times when American system, but it's over their American units, work perfectly with British units, or SI units, or any other units, um, because it's dimensionless. Provided, of course, that you're measuring your extension and your original length in the same thing, um, which is quite nice. It doesn't really help us that much, but it's kind of cool. So that brings us to this idea of Young's modulus. So the Young's modulus of material is the amount of stress required per unit strain. So to write that as, equa as an equation, I can say that Y is equal to sigma over epsilon. If you remember our equation, sigma is force per unit area, and I'm dividing that by change in length over original length. Now, if you remember uh, your GCSE uh, maths, you should remember that if you have A divided by B divided by C divided by D, that's exactly the same as saying A over B multiplied by D over C. So the, the sort of cheap and lazy trick is to just invert uh, your second fraction. Uh, and write it like that. So this equation becomes force divided by area multiplied by change in length over length. Or, to write it uh, more neatly, force delta L over AL is equal to Young's modulus. Now, if we think about our dimensional analysis, uh, we found on the previous slide that we measure uh, F over L, which is sigma. That has the units of pascals. A over L, sorry, um, what am I doing here? Yeah, uh, sorry, F over, uh, I'm gonna go back a little bit. I'm gonna do it from this stage, because it's a little bit simpler, because um, it's the same thing. Uh, force divided by area, that is uh, still in Pascal's, and L over L is still dimensionless, there has no units, because uh, it's still a meter over a meter. So, we have the unit of Pascal's for it. Uh, now, in practice, we tend to use gigapascal's, um, or megapascal's, because most materials, if you think about what this is saying, um, it's saying how much force we need to get um, quite a significant amount of extension. So you would need a huge amount of force um, to get the extension because you're, you're essentially saying how much force is required uh, to turn a one meter squared, uh, one meter long uh, cylinder into two meters long. Um, and that's quite a lot of force. So usually you find that those, those uh, units are very, very high. So let's just sum up some of the uh, differences between them. Uh, so Young's modulus, that is a general equation. And it applies to any material. So steel has Young's modulus. You can go and look it up. Uh, copper has Young's modulus. Force constant is specific. 
So there is a specific spring that has a force constant of 10 newtons per metre. Um, you can go and buy that spring, but it's unique to that particular spring. If you make that spring out of a different material with the same dimensions, it'll have a different force constant. Uh, Young's modulus is uh, usually in gigapascals uh, or megapascals, whereas force constant is in newtons per metre. Um, and obviously the equation, uh, Young's modulus is stress over strain, force constant is force divided by uh, extension. Um, so those are the kind of the key differences between those things. Now, your homework, and what I would like you to do uh, after watching this video, as a little extra homework, is now to consider how are you going to find the Young's modulus of the material should be fairly straightforward for you to think about that, uh, but in our next lesson, that's what I want you to kick off with. So I'm going to give you a range of different metals, I'm going to give you the bench pulleys that you used last lesson, uh, and I'm going to ask you to just go ahead and find for me the Young's modulus of different materials. And this time, um, we can check your answers quite easily, because if I give you a steel wire, we can look up the Young's modulus of steel to see if you've got the right answer. So there may be prizes for the people that get the closest. I hope this all made sense to you. If you do have any questions, uh, please talk to me in the lesson. Uh, or you can drop me an email. Uh, but otherwise, I will see you in our next lesson. Thank you for watching.